Sure. Um, our first item, as always, is uh, roll call. Um, for people who haven't done this before, we'll go around the room uh, and do introductions of um, both TPCC and TTEC members. Uh, just please state your name and, and affiliation. And so we'll start on the table and then go through the audience. I'm uh, Jordan Hess, City Council. Jean Curtis, representing the County Commission. Don MacArthur, Missoula Urban Transportation District. Lynn Helligard, Missoula River Valley TMA. Mike Kane, City of Missoula. I'm John Stegmeyer with Missoula County Parks Trails Open Lands Program. Vicki Cernich with MTD, MDT Proxy for Carol Strizich. Ed Taves, MDT Missoula. Debbie Johnston, and I'm representing the Missoula City County Health Department, Health Board, sorry. Uh, Sarah Cofield, I'm here representing the Health Department. Dory Brown, the Missoula County. Donna Gockler, Parks and Recreation. Pat O'Haran, Missoula County Community and Planning Services. Eric Dixon, proxy for Brent O'Connor with County Public Works. Great, thank you. Um, so we have uh, minutes from the TPCC uh, meeting of August 21st uh, to be approved. I'd entertain a motion from one of the TPCC members to approve those. Thank you, Ed. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thanks. Um, any discussion on the motion or, or comment from TTAC or the public? Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the, the minutes are approved. Um, is there any public comment on items not listed elsewhere on our agenda? Okay, uh, we have uh, two ad agenda items. I'm going to take them in the opposite order. Um, the first item will be uh, item 4.2, which is to review and approve amendment number one to the 2019 to 2023 tip. And um, Aaron Wilson will present that item. All right, thanks, Aaron Wilson, the Transportation Division Manager for the City of Missoula. Uh, this first item is a, uh, as Jordan mentioned, is an amendment to the, our, well, recently adopted, but I don't know if the TIP has been officially reviewed and approved by MDT and FHWA. So this is essentially an amendment to the document that was approved by TPCC back in August, and we will resubmit that to MDT for review. It essentially follows the same process as a TIP amendment, but it won't really show up as a TIP amendment. It'll just be a revised FY19 Transportation Improvement Program. Does that make sense to everyone? It's just sort of the timing and the way that this happened. We already approved through TPCC, but it had, the TIP hadn't been reviewed, so we'll just amend that document and then resubmit it for approval. So there's only a couple of, of changes in this amendment. Um, these were provided to us by MDT a couple of weeks ago. Typically we go through a, a 30 day public notice and review for TIP amendments, but due to the time sensitive nature of these amendments, um, trying to get particularly the Higgins Street Bridge, um, MDT wants to get that project rolling and um, out for bid so that whoever um, ends up with that bid can get started on construction next season so that we can expect that work hopefully to start next year on the Higgins Bridge. Um, they're fairly minor changes. Uh, they, for the Higgins Bridge, there's an additional, you should have this, there's a, they're both in bridge program, so we have one handout just from that page from the tip. It's all that's changing. So for the Higgins Avenue Bridge, there's an additional $290,000 uh, in PE, that's engineering for 2019, to cover um, some additional costs that weren't in the initial scope related to the relocation of the stairs, I believe down to Karis Park, 
um, some landscaping and other engineering design requirements on that project. The uh, other change is with the Bitter River Bridge. That's the McClay or South Avenue Bridge project. There's an additional 363,000 in PE for that project. Um, and that's to cover, some, again, some additional engineering and design, some environmental analysis and documentation, and Endangered Species Act compliance that's uh, required for that project. So those are the only two changes that we have proposed in this TIP amendment. Um, so if there's any questions or any other, anything else that I could provide, I'd be happy to do so. Okay. Any questions or discussion? Okay, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the TIP amendment from TPCC. I would move to adopt the number of it, the TIP amendment as proposed today in the, for the bridge program. Thank you, that motion is in order. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ed. Um, any uh, discussion or public comment? All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Um, and is approved. Um, so we'll spend the balance of our time on, um, uh, with a presentation and update on uh, Mountain Lines uh, 2018 strategic plan. Um, and um, Vince, are you are you doing an introduction, or are we? Am I turning it right over to Mich or Corey? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Corey Aldridge. I'm the general manager of Missoula Urban Transportation District, or Mountain Line. Uh, presenting with me today is Michelle Poyoro mm -hmm. uh, with Jarrett Walker and Associates, our consultant for this planning process. Uh, also with me today is uh, Bill Pfeiffer, uh, who's with our community uh, outreach efforts, and Vince Cristo overseeing our projects and planning. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and share our 2018 strategic plan with you today. So public transit benefits us all. Uh, benefits us all by creating a quality community uh, that is attractive to employers and residents. It benefits us all by reducing traffic and congestion and parking congestion and improving air quality. Uh, benefits us all by getting people where they need to be and it is a lifeline to keep seniors and, dis and the disabled active, mobile, and independent. So from our planning efforts in 2012, uh, the community has seen uh, the addition of high frequency 15 minute bolt service on two of our routes, later evening service, and enhanced paratransit services. And thanks to our 20 partners, public and private partners, we also have the implementation of Zero Fare was introduced in 2015. So Mountain Lane uh, fare collection in 2014 was roughly $460,000, or about 9% of our budget. Uh, by the partners coming together, they were able to uh, replace the cost of fares, uh, which are for many of the organizations are fares that they were already purchasing for clients and employees, and now they're turning this benefit to the entire community. Uh, it also removes barriers for riding for everyone. It's amazing how much uh, the cost of a fare can make a difference between riding or not. Also because of that, routes are faster because the buses have to spend less time at each stop. Uh, the Zero Fare program has been really successful, so successful that our partners have agreed to continue it for an additional three years through the end of 2020. All of these changes have resulted in high ridership. We've seen a 70% increase in ridership over the last three years. When you compare that with uh, peer cities, which are, most of them are seeing a decrease in ridership, we're seeing uh, a great, great increase in ridership. It outpaces the service increases and the city growth. Uh, we also are experiencing higher productivity because of that. So as ridership has increased, uh, the cost of rides uh, have gone down, resulting in a more efficient transit system. And ride, uh, 
the additions make public transit more uh, useful to more people in the community. The ridership gains have also been instrumental in us receiving some discretionary grant awards, uh, which will help us purchase electric buses and do bus stop improvements throughout our system. So it shows that past investment by the community uh, have created these awesome results. And future investments in public transit will create an even more connected, livable community. And because of the increase in ridership, uh, the strong economy, increased development, and throughout it was time for Mountain Line to update its plan to ensure we continue to align ourselves with the needs and desires of the community. So in early 2017, the Transportation District hired Jarrett Walker and Associates to help us create a new plan. I'll turn the time over to Michelle from here. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Corey already introduced me, but I'll, I'll say it again. I'm Michelle Poiro. I'm a principal associate with a transit planning firm called Jarrett Walker and Associates, and we are based in Oregon. We're a small firm with just 10 staff people, and we specialize in doing exactly this kind of plan for communities like yours. And I'm joined by my colleague who's sitting right behind me, Chris Yuen. Um, he was particularly responsible for looking closely at the city and MPO's other adopted transportation goals and looking at the land use plans for Missoula and making sure that this plan relates to those plans and responds to those plans. So I would like to um, talk you through a couple concepts and also give you a tour of the map packet that you should all have in front of you. Um, so we're not quite going to get into the map packet yet, but please do have it close. I want to tell you a little bit about our timeline. We're at the end of this timeline on the right-hand side of it, but this all started in April of 2017, so about a year and a half ago. We published a choices report which described the existing function of transit in Missoula, but also pointed out some key choices that the people of Missoula would need to consider uh, about the future, about transit in the future. We engaged the public in that first phase with a stakeholder workshop for key stakeholders, public meetings, and web surveys. Then we designed some alternatives, and we again presented those to the public, and again engaged the public in those same ways and took input. And then we came up with a draft plan, and again put it out for public review at meetings and through web surveys, and incorporated that third round of public input, and that is what produced the final plan that the MUTD board has approved. So um, repeated public consultation on uh, the questions of values about which uh, the public, public's opinion really matters a great deal. We can bring the technical advice, but there are questions of values uh, for which our opinion doesn't matter. What really matters is what the people in your community want. So um, that's how we consulted them throughout the process. So I want to um, draw your attention to the first map on your packet, which is of your existing transit network. And this, look, this map looks a little different from the map that Mountain Line pub currently publishes uh, in that it colors routes differently depending on their frequency. So how long of a wait do they offer? Uh, the shorter wait they offer, the brighter their color. So you can see that routes one and two, which are the bolt routes, are here in red, um, and then lower frequency routes are in less bright colors. Also at the bottom is a frequency table, and this shows you how, what are the frequency of routes throughout the day on weekdays and on Saturdays and on Sundays, and you can see Sunday is blank because there is no service offered on Sundays. And you can see Saturdays, pretty short span of service, just 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and uh, only routes only coming once an hour during that time. So I'm, I'm showing you this so that you can see uh, the differences in the future scenarios that are on future pages. All right, if you turn the page to the short-term plan network, this is the network that we recommend based on public and community input, based on existing adopted goals for the city, based on board guidance from the MUTBD board. This is the plan we recommend for the next maybe five years, depending on available funding, depending on the ability to make uh, you know, infrastructure changes. The big difference here 
is an expansion of service into later hours in the evening and into longer weekend service. So longer service days on Saturday, you'll see that in the frequency table at bottom, and adding Sunday service. There are a few other changes in the network itself, meaning in where routes go, but they're not huge changes because the truth is your network is actually quite well designed for the resources that you have available. So there are a few changes in here that respond to development, but other than that, the shape of the network would stay roughly the same. The big investment here would be in longer spans of service, evening service, weekend service, and then to a lesser degree, higher frequency service. So if you look at the frequency table, you can see that Route 7 would get to higher frequency on weekdays every 15 minutes, and also um, there would be a new Route 15 offering frequent service in the North Reserve area. So there's certainly more details in here, but uh, I'm happy to respond to questions about it, but I'll keep moving. Um, really important thing I want to tell you is that this long-term plan um, represents transit's, transit's loving response to the land use planning that many of you have already done. So uh, there's, a, there's a really good way for uh, a, a regular and iterative and collaborative conversation to happen between transit planning and land use planning. And we had a chance to um, make a statement as part of that conversation with this plan. So that is a many, many years long conversation. You've already been having it. You put out the Our Missoula Growth Strategy. You put out your long range transportation plan and they are, they are reflecting one another. Um, and the way that, that this can go is you know, a growth plan or a land use plan comes out, the transit agency and the transit planners take it, they read it, and then they basically respond and they say, hey, we see you've planned this growth over here. Uh, we can actually run more frequent service in that area to make that growth more sustainable and affordable. But we also see you've put some growth over here. And that's actually a very hard place for transit to serve for various reasons. So we're not actually going to suggest transit over there. We don't think we can provide transit over there. And in your next growth plan, please reconsider where that growth is put. So we can respond positively and echo the parts of a growth plan that are very transit oriented, but we can also give some constructive criticism or some feedback about where the growth might not be uh, as transit oriented or where transit is less likely to succeed. So that's exactly what we've done in response to the growth plan. And then in response to the long range transportation plan, we looked at the adopted goals and um, working with mountain line staff, working with the board, we figured out, well, what kind of transit service and what kind of transit network would actually be necessary to achieve those adopted transportation goals? So this is, this is a statement in a long conversation between transit, transportation planning, and land use planning. We think you're doing a really good job of having that conversation in this community, and we're happy to just get to participate in one part of it. I know it will continue long after this transit plan. So if you work on land use planning or transportation planning, please read the transit plan and then think of your own feedback, your own responses to put in the next iteration of your own plans in whatever area of expertise you work in. We took the Our Missoula Growth Policy map. There is a map in that plan that shows land use designations, and we remade it. So this shows the same information, the same land use designations, but we remade it with a color scheme that helps you see patterns that are meaningful in transit. Patterns that are meaningful when you ask the question of, is transit likely to reach very many people here? How useful can transit be here? So um, we hope that this will also be used as you have ongoing conversations about transit and land use. This is your own land use plan. We just changed the colors, basically. So this is what underlies the long-term network. So if you flip to the next page in your map packet, past the growth policy, land use page to the long-term plan network page. This is a much more, uh, much, uh, more robust network requiring a great deal more funding for the long term. So this is a long term vision, maybe 15, 20 years out. And uh, again, red lines mean higher frequency, blue lines mean moderate frequency, and green lines mean lower frequency. 
So a couple things that are distinctive here. Um, once you have this much service, you can actually arrange it into what is called a frequent grid. And that means you have multiple red lines crossing in multiple places, multiple frequent lines making connections in multiple places, which means that people can go from anywhere to anywhere on that network with one easy transfer. And this is, this, this is the kind of network that you start to see in bigger cities. So this is sort of the plan for you know, when Missoula becomes a, a more urban place, at least in its core. This network would provide people with a great deal of freedom to move around that urban part of the, of the city. Um, you can also see a very dark red line down Arthur Street. That is a hyper-frequent service um, serving what is obviously a great deal of demand around the university and student housing. Uh, and then if you look down at the, fre at the frequency table at the bottom, uh, not only is there later weekday service and Sunday service, which we recommended in the short-term plan, there's also higher frequencies on Saturdays. So on Saturdays, this plan would have you turn up your frequency of service so many routes are coming every 30 minutes. Lynn? Um, on those higher frequency routes, um, I see that they are either um, mirroring the UM system. Does this incorporate that into it, or are we looking at replacing the U system, or where are we at there? Thank you. That is a great question. Um, we, this does not presume that the arrangements made by the university for its own transportation needs, made with mountain between the university and mountain line change. Doesn't assume any change. However, we do think there are opportunities to collaborate. And we've talked with Councilor Hess about that. We've, you know, we've talked with mountain line about that. I think that's an ongoing conversation. Um, and we certainly have experience in other cities of helping or watching cities and transit providers and universities figure out how they can collaborate in ways that benefit both of them maintain the university's uh, autonomy in terms of its need to, to meet its own travel needs. Um, don't saddle the city with costs that are really the responsibility of the university. I mean, there, you know, there are a lot of things to consider in that negotiation, but there's certainly potential for good partnership between a transit provider and a university in general and probably in this city as well. But this does not require any change to what the university and the students are doing. Uh, it could certainly be supplementary to what the university and the students are doing, or it could be complementary and could arise through partnership. All right, so this network responds to the growth plans land use designations. It also responds to the long range, plan, long range transportation plans mode split targets. This network requires many times more funding than exists, than is in use today. I believe it's in my notes, but now I can't see my notes. I believe it's four times, do you remember? Sorry, that four times more funding than the current network? Uh, I Okay, somewhere between two and four times as much funding as your existing network. So it is quite a growth in the transit budget, but this is actually what is necessary if you want to achieve the modal targets in your long range transportation plan. So you've set ambitious, I don't mean you personally, I mean as a city, you have set ambitious targets for transit ridership and for non drive alone transportation in your transportation plan. And so we, the transit planners, can tell you, here's what you would need to do to achieve those modal targets and to serve the land use as you've designated it. And it would require raising more money for transit. It would also require partnership from the city and the county and the MPO in a couple other areas. So if you flip to the next page, this map is called the Primary Transit Network. This is not a map anymore of transit routes. So these aren't routes. These are corridors and segments that, that are, are derived from the routes on the previous page. So the reason they're here on this map is because we know that they're extremely likely to have frequent service in the long term. They are red lines on the previous page. Um, and that makes them very good places to locate growth, especially things like affordable housing, social services, uh, medical services, 
because these are the places where that growth is most likely to be benefited by permanent and frequent transit service. But these are also, therefore, the roads and the streets on which Mountain Line most needs support from the city and the MPO, and in some cases the county and the state, in creating streetscapes, creating traffic conditions and public places that help transit succeed. So sidewalk investments, pedestrian crossings, room for bus stops, signals that allow a certain turn by a bus, all those kinds of things are not in Mountain Line's purview. They need their partners at the city and other agencies to help them manage the streets and create public space that allows the transit service to exist and allows the transit service to exceed, succeed. And these are the streets on which that will be most important because this is where Mountain Line will make its biggest investment in transit operating costs, its biggest investment in transit service. So anything you can do in your role to help move forward the necessary projects on these streets, you know, which could be as small as a pedestrian crossing, um, or, or as small as you know snow removal, but as big as uh, you know total streetscape redesign. Um, if those are necessary for transit service, then your partnership is really important to the success of that transit service. So th this map shows two color, three col three, two colors, four patterns. Um, orange lines are primary transit network segments that already have service on them today. Frequent service, uh, or sorry service on them today, frequent service in the short-term plan. The purple lines are primary transit network segments that don't have frequent service on them today and may not have any service on them today, but we can see that in the long term they are very likely to have frequent service on them. And then you'll see uh, there's a little pattern that's the hollow purple line and that is just an alternate routing where it's not uh, there, you know, a, another different route can be taken until the primary route is available. So in this case, Stevens can be used until Brooks is appropriate. And then finally, you'll see a dash line, which is reserve, which is a contingent or candidate segment. Um, reserve is too hostile to walking to yet be part of the primary transit network. But that can change. And if that changes, then it should be treated as part of the primary transit network because of the growth that is planned around it. Okay, last page of your maps. To just as a demonstration of what I just said about how Mountain Line does not control many of the things that make its transit succeed. Um, one of those is, for example, capital projects. There are projects relating to roads, relating to pedestrian access, relating to uh, bus stops and signalization that are necessary to allow for some of the service shown in that long-term network map. And they, Mountain Line, if once it is time to add that service, they will only be able to do so if these projects take place. And so the agencies and groups you represent will probably be involved in some of these projects. So um, we can certainly give you more details about these, if not off the top of our head, then by email later on. And of course, they're all detailed in the plan, but I just wanted to give you a sense of a very specific type of partnership that might be needed, which is a partnership around capital projects and infrastructure. And that is the end of my presentation. We're happy to take questions. Yes, questions. I want to, before that, I would like to uh, put out a little pitch. If any of you would like us to come and present to your organization uh, on this plan, we would love to do so. So just let us know. Okay, thank you. Any questions or discussion on the plan? Commissioner. I have a few pages. They have short notes. Um, number one, in the, so I, this, I'm referring to the whole um, packet that we were um, sent electronically. So on page four in the intro, it talks about how mountain line should benefit those with, uh, how it should benefit people, but it seems to me like it doesn't focus on uh, folks that might, as you just mentioned, need access to social services, those with lower income and health needs. I know when the county um, invested in the zero fare, which of course is why we have such a, an increase in ridership, um, our goal was to help folks who needed the help the most. Somebody that doesn't have a car, uh, 
and um, or money for gas. So um, we've brought this up before in visiting with Corey. I know that um, someone from PHC went to the board meeting, but there's no route shown here or in the future and um, that uh, goes to Partnership Health Center, the health department, the food bank, and the library directly. So free fare to me should benefit the people that need it the most. So there's, there's an income equity issue, there's a social justice issue, and I would like to see um, some of that added to you know, what the goal of having um, public transportation should be. Uh, I know that um, Partnership Health Center has identified a need for their clients to get transportation right from their space to um, the food bank. So that is a need of the clients, um, a majority of their clients. It's also, um, to me, one of those invest health things that the community has invested in, one of our community values. There's also, um, I'm just, I just have a list of points as I went through. I kind of did them by page, but there's reference, of course, to the focus inward. But to me, um, it's you're not going to be able to grow this town by 48 percent and put them all inward. There's going to have to be some outward, and there's a lot of reference to the R Missoula um, land use plan, but there's no reference to the county's plans. Um, and of course, we're, we do have our growth plan done. We're right now working on our map uh, to go with that. But the urban area around the city is like another city. It's there's 20 over 20,000 people that live in the in the urban area around outside the city limits. Uh, that's where the jobs are going to go. That's where residents are going to go. Um, so should be reflected a little bit more, at least in the narrative. I also wonder who, and so this is a question I'll just keep rattling through and maybe you can answer, but I, I wonder who was missing in the stakeholder groups. Um, so there's, there is reference again about transit usefulness, but I just wondered if you had any focus groups at PHC, at the food bank, at the health department, at the um, places where um, the folks who could use it the most uh, might be part of a group. Um, on page 10, there's a reference to, as the city annexes, to make sure that, um, that, that folks um, are required to annex into the district, um, which makes sense for their service. But, you know, when the, when the focus inward effort happened, uh, Mullen Road was a very busy um, route. Uh, of course, it used to go clear out to the mill where, it took a, the, where there were workers going. Uh, in Frenchtown, but uh, we get calls periodically from folks who live in areas that are, if you look in the um, report where you show where the district is, that pay, you know, upwards to $200 a year for Mountain Lion, and there's, I've had people call and say, I stood out here all day, the bus never went by. So there is that. And the Mullen Corridor is one that has uh, a lot of people that were required to annex into the district as part of past subdivisions when there was service and now there is no service. So I think it's just something you need to keep in mind. Um, on page 19, you talk about people's ability to walk and that, that to me is part of the deal. So if someone comes to the transfer station downtown right now, I was in my head doing the figuring how far it is to get to the health department. It's almost a quarter of a mile, and it's almost a half a mile to get to PHC. So that does make a difference. And to me, that route can jog over there and get right back to St. Pat's um, very easily with a bus. And it would sure be easier when you're either toting children to go to your WIC appointment or you're going over to PHC for medical. Um, let's see. Miller Creek is always one that I see it's in the future plans and I know it's um, been challenging and not all the subdivisions up there do pay in, but it seems like that's a population that we should, con I, I just have to um, represent my constituents who live outside the city limits. 
As again, as I said on page 43, talking about focus inward, there's not room for 48% growth in this town's population inward. It is going to go west. Um, and I wondered about, is the Wyoming, does the Wyoming and Johnson route that's listed on page 44 as Route 19, does that get to the food bank? It seemed like maybe it did, but I wasn't sure. Um, and then page 53 outlines there is paying that, like I said, with no service. Um, page 58 again talks about transit usefulness and providing personal freedom and opportunity. And I think that, that there are, there is a population of folks that we're not um, giving that opportunity to. And then uh, Commissioner Strohmeyer also offered, um, handed me a note about Route 4 to Bonner and wondered if there would be more opportunities to increase the span of service or frequency on a seasonal basis to reflect increased river recreation as we um, now have the Milltown State Park and once the bridges are um, complete so folks can um, you know, maybe put their tubes instead of their bikes on the front of your bus and, and float to town, but it, they, we'd probably want a little bit more frequency. So those were my comments with a couple questions in the middle. Thank you, Commissioner Curtis. Um, do you want to um, respond to those uh, questions at this time, and then we'll go around for more discussion? I don't know that I will be able to answer all those, but if, if you, uh, Commissioner Curtis, if you would email those to us, that would be really helpful. Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that you are, uh, that you've brought up are uh, questions that we have uh, dealt with and grappled with over the years, uh, w especially with relocation uh, where uh, organizations decide to locate makes it very challenging for transit to serve. So what uh, we've asked organizations to think about when they're planning for the future is to locate along our transit routes rather than expecting transit to go to them. When we deviate uh, from a route, it makes it very challenging for us to uh, stay on time. We put service where it uh, does the most good for the most people. Uh, we're aware that there are a number of organizations that are near bus routes, but just not quite close enough. And that, that is a challenge, absolutely. Although I would say the Partnership Health Center has invested millions and millions of dollars in its locations, it's not going to move. And it's really two blocks from Spruce Street. So I, I think there are some that um, uh, the health department's been there for 40 years. They're not going to move. So. The library is moving one block. So, and the, you know, I mean, they've got investments too. So I, I guess, to me, having a bus jog over and still get the same place, you, between the transit station and St. Patrick Hospital, there's no spot for you to stop and pick people up. That's just crazy traffic. It would be nuts for you to even try that. So to jog over and get to the same point by St. Pat's with a half an hour or a half a mile little route is not unreasonable to me. I do have one more thing I forgot. As you go forward to your bus um, stop improvements, I really want, I hope that you look at, um, and I'm sure you are, but accessibility, because some of them are just, you know, there's a bus bench sitting there and it's dirt. Um, Safety, and in regard to that, is lighting. So, and I think there's some simple things you could do in the short term. For example, um, the the Bolt route that goes from um, downtown and heads to Target, and there's a bus stop there behind Target. I would guess that if you went and talked to Target, they would put a light on the back of their store. You know, because I've done that route. My mom is in assisted living out in that area, so I've done that route in the dark a lot. And um, it seems like lighting is a big factor. And maybe it could even be solar lighting. It's expensive to put in to begin with, but it's good. And then garbage. I've just noticed, um, uh, I actually saw someone pull over the other day and put garbage in a garbage can at one of your bus stops, which isn't what they're for. But um, sometimes if it's not picked up, there's garbage then spread into the neighbor's yard. So. You know, maybe if you can just address, I don't know if we have garbage cans, maybe once a, once a day the bus driver grabs a bag or something, or your, or your route goes around, or 
make arrangements, but uh, garbage is an issue. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, any additional questions or discussion at this time? Uh, Sarah. Uh, just for my own curiosity, on your long-term required infrastructure projects, are these wish lists or things that are already part of the LRTP? For example, um, the road you have on number eight for a construction project that goes through Roseburg, um, I, I'm, I'm just really curious about that. That is actually in the circulation plan for that area. There's a local, I'm forgetting the terminology, but it's a local district plan or something like that. And that road is in that local plan. So it's already been adopted by, through a separate process. So um, yes, I guess you could describe this as a wish list, but it's not just wish, it's um, actual prerequisite necessary, but not sufficient projects for service. So our Missoula growth uh, plans have quite a bit of growth in this area north of the railroad. Um, the local district plan or local area plan has a road there, and we are saying once that road is built, if it is built, then it will be possible to serve the growth indicated in the Our Missoula Growth Plan. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that the growth plan for that northern part of Missoula was, um, my office recommended against a lot of what into that plan because it's putting so much residential use next to heavy industry that could be very dangerous. Um, so uh, that's just my, my take on that and putting a road through that industrial area. Um, I, I don't know that, that it would, is going to necessarily be terribly likely to happen. Uh, Roseburg was not terribly thrilled, to my knowledge, with that plan that went forward. Um, and they have chosen not to be annexed into the city on multiple different occasions. Uh, but thank you. That's great clarification. I appreciate it. So if I may put that in a bigger context, that's a great example of the kind of iteration, right? So it may be that the next time Mountain Line does this, the message is, oh, actually, we don't think the growth is going to happen up there for X, Y, and Z reasons. Uh, so you d maybe don't need to prioritize putting service up there. And there's unlikely to be a road that you can run down. Um, but also, some of these other projects are in the Long Range Transportation Plan already, and we are saying, uh, you know, there's a specific aspect that is necessary for transit service, or it is particularly important for transit for these reasons. Um, so not all of these are news, are going to be news. Uh, some of them, this is a repetition of things that have been described as important in other plans. Um, building on that, though, with the planned uh, low-income housing project that is actually going in, in that area with a 200-unit multifamily complex, I have been concerned about what that will mean for congestion and traffic in that area, it is already a lower income area in Missoula, and bus service is rare. Um, it comes, um, which is great. Like, thankfully, we do have a bus that comes right up into that, that area. Uh, but if we put a housing complex with 200 units for low income families, we need to have reliable transit for them. And right now, with, even with the frequency you have here, that's not reflecting that growth that's already been planned and approved. The lack of through roads in that area and the lack of pedestrian connections across the railroad make it very difficult to provide useful transit service there. Um, I think you raise an interesting point, Michelle, about the iterative nature of this. Um, and um, you know, I know looking at the last um, long range plan, um, this has a lot of really consistent themes um, that have been, you know, of course, refreshed and updated and, and um, you know, uh, made relevant for um, for the current state of, of uh, land use planning and transportation projects around the community. So um, can you talk about, about um, Michelle or Corey, about the lifespan of this plan and um, uh, sort of um, the idea that you may have out your projects that are pretty nebulous at this time um, and um, those, um, why do you do that? Why, why, why is the, what's the planning horizon? What's the, um, what's the um, immediate, uh, utility of um, the plan, um, when do you revise the plan, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Do you want to say anything? Sure. So as far as planning processes go, uh, let's, for example, the 2012 plan that we did, uh, a lot has changed between 2012 and, and current. And so as the community changes, the needs of the community change, development patterns change, tr uh, travel patterns change, that's when we see uh, a need to update this plan. So we look out into the future as far as we can 
uh, with the information that we do have to try to uh, create a plan for, for the future so that everything we do uh, is uh, in sync with each other. With, if you look at the 2012 plan and the current plan, a lot of the, the same projects that took place or that were planned are carried forward into this plan. And as things have changed, we've updated the plan as necessary. So we continue to do this process. It'll be an ongoing uh, process uh, as long as Mount Land exists. We, uh, typically every four to six years, we will go and, and uh, do a major update. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important to um, just uh, keep that in mind that we do that with our, our MPO adopted long range plan and, and it's it's prudent, good process. Um, so appreciate and that. I'd like to add something. Um, one, one thing that will cause this plan to go out of date in a really good way is if and when additional funding is raised for transit, because that will allow Mountain Line to implement a number of elements in the short range part of the plan, and then they may be ready to do more. Uh, but another thing that also could cause it to go out of date, again in a good way, is if the land use plan is substantially updated, um, or if your transportation plan is substantially updated, then that might trigger new changes. So because it's, it's both a call and a response, um, the work done by other planning agencies in the city and in the county can cause it to uh, be time for a new, a new evaluation, a new evolution. Uh, Debbie. So it was noted on the long-term plan network that it, um, the cost of that was two to four times the existing um, budget. What's, yes, and what's the estimated cost of the short-term plan network increases? Thank you. Chris uh, reminded me the cost of the long-term plan to operate is 2.5 times the operating cost of the existing network. And now you're asking me another question. I can't remember the answer to. What's the What's the cost of the ah, short term compared the short, to the existing network? The short term compared to the existing network. Let us do quick math. Just a moment. About two thirds more. So the short-term network would cost about two-thirds more to operate than the existing network. The long-term network would cost two and a half times as much to operate as the existing network. And I should mention this does not include capital costs. So this does not include the cost of purchasing new buses, purchasing bus shelters, or crucially, expanding the bus depot because currently, the bus depot where the buses are stored and maintained is at, it is maxed out. They cannot get, they cannot add new buses to the fleet. They therefore cannot actually run more frequent service um, without ex getting more buses and therefore without getting a bigger depot. So that's something that we should also mention because that's another process that's happening right now. Um, so it's not, not just the operating costs that are a limitation, but operating costs are perpetual and ongoing and so that's really important ratio to keep in mind. Thank you. Lynn. Um, just a question. Um, have there been any discussions about what some view as mountain line running duplicate routes of the university system and maybe you or a mountain line abandoning those routes so that they can maybe put those resources to address the concerns that Jean and Sarah had about um, lack of service to the low income areas in the city? So yes, there, there are some slight duplications in some routes. Uh, keep in mind that uh, UDASH is a seasonal system that runs during the school year. Uh, there are a number of uh, months where it doesn't operate, where uh, the citizens in the community still need to travel and need to get around. Uh, we continue to work more and more uh, closely with UDASH and look at how we can complement each other uh, rather than duplicate each other. Okay. Oh, Donna. I have a curiosity question. On route uh, long-term Route 1A going through South Avenue, is there a way to slip a bus through without reconnecting the highway? I'm sorry, going through where? <laughs> Route 1A um, yeah. goes down South Avenue, and obviously when we, you know, have South Avenue stop on either side of 
Brooks Russell, we create a barrier for transportation, alternative transportation or active transportation. Yeah. So you're Is there a to way to just slip bikes, peds, and buses through and not reconnect the whole system without building over or under? So this um, this relates to a capital project number three, right. which is on the very last page. Uh, capital project number three is a desired um, simplification, pedestrianization of the entire Russell South Brooks intersection. Mm -hmm. um, the current operation of that intersection makes undermines the value of transit service there. And so to the extent that intersection in the future, years in the future, can be made simpler and allow transit service to s travel in a straight line that feels direct to passengers and provide service in both directions on the same street or on very nearby streets, that will make transit more effective and useful. And so we have drawn the desired, hoped for pattern here, understanding that you cannot actually drive buses like this in the existing street network. So this is the kind of thing that we will show in the long-term network. If you look at the map of the short-term network, you'll see the existing street network is what governs where the routes go. Does that answer your question? Really asking is, um, can the system stay as it is, but a, a bus, uh, get, can a bus get moved into the interactive signalization so that only the bus would be able to get through there. That sounds like a nice idea, but. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. Um, so I think you bring up some great points about the um, us as stakeholders in, um, in road building or in um, housing development um, uh, have, or in other, in other fields have obligations in order to make transit um, high functioning. Um, I'm really excited to see um, the bus stops uh, under construction on Russell Street right now. I think those um, uh, have a, those are a great example of what you're talking about, where the uh, Department of Transportation has allowed you to um, uh, run on an arterial and stop in the lane um, and quickly re-enter traffic. Um, and so that's a great example to me. Um, I think another good example is when we talk about uh, housing development, um, parcel selection is incredibly important given the high operating costs of transit and, and the, the impracticalities of diverting a bus. Um, can you give us some other examples of ways that we can help um, as stakeholders or as community partners uh, help support and advance this plan? Those, those are the sort of things that we're looking for as, as development uh, is planned or uh, going to happen that uh, Mountain Line is brought into that conversation so that we can uh, help uh, make the project as good as it possibly can uh, and accessible for transit. On the land use side, um, if you or your friends or colleagues work on development housing, social services, medical services, I would say print out this purple and orange map of the primary transit network and put it on the wall of your cubicle or your office so that every time you're having a conversation with someone or helping someone who is making a, a, a decision about where to move, where to locate, where to build, um, you can reference this and they can make a good decision with high probability that in the future their, their choice will result in good transit access. That, that's part of the goal here is it's not that people are obliged to locate near the transit network, it's that we want people to have good information so that if transit is important to them or their customers or their clients, that they have all the information they possibly can when they're deciding where to locate and how close to get to the transit network. So I would say, you know, print out this map, um, get get to know these corridors, reference it in your own work on these issues, um, because that, that will give people the information they need to make the choice that's right for them and for their own constituents. Okay. Um, I have uh, Don and then Ben. Um, so, speaking in my role as a um, Mountain Line board member, uh, I just wanted to say uh, a thank you first to the community for their investment at our previous, um, you know, at 2012, I guess. Um, and to, uh, I think Corey highlighted them a little bit in the beginning, but to recognize at that moment we were trying to think about 
how can the mountain lion better support the community? What does the community want? And, um, and serve it. Corey sort of went through the number of, of successes that we've had in the last um, five or six years around that. The, the purpose of this exercise here is to hear um, how do we continue that? How do we continue to make um, mountain lion um, relevant and um, you know, a real true partner in the community um, continual success? So the, some of the things that I heard you say, Gene, and, and, uh, are absolutely at the core of what we view as a success, which is the question about how do we provide great access and connectivity throughout the community for all people who live here. And, the, and the, really the question is, uh, is sort of, it, it's easy to think that we certainly, in an ideal world, would want to serve every one of the uses that you said. Um, and the question then becomes, how do we spread our resources to maximize that benefit? Um, and we also, you know, I think it was you who said something about um, how do we live, provide access for people without cars? and. Uh, at this moment, um, what the board has been feeling is that the key gap, the, there are certainly gaps of service that we understand we'd like to solve. Um, but we also think one of the key gaps is this question of coverage in terms of span of service uh, and Saturday and weekend service. And that that, you know, if someone can ride the bus to church that they haven't been able to do, or that they can uh, ride the bus to their um, home from work at, at 8.30 where they couldn't before, that it changes the whole dynamic of what transit can provide for an individual and maybe allows them to live um, with one car in a, in a family instead of two or no cars um, in a way that is not currently possible. So that feels like the sort of game changer that we are hoping to create. And, and the, you know, some of the trade-offs or balance points around that have to do with um, you know, how circuitous are our routes every time we do a, a diversion to hit a particular spot. It costs us money and resources that then can't go toward longer service or more frequent service. And so the, it's this balance point where we're trying to create this place that, that uh, truly allows people um, good access everywhere with, uh, with lots of different starting points in terms of their, of their resources. So we're, we're totally sensitive to all those questions. And then you know, the question becomes, how do we balance those choices um, to, to really maximize our benefit? I, I think, you know, I, and I guess I'd come back to that, what happened in 2012 between the, the bolt routes, which I think have been very, very successful and sort of changed our understanding about what transit can mean in terms of just go out and, and go to the stop without worrying about, is it gonna be 35 minutes away or is it, is it not? That sort of schedule free thing is it feels game changing to me. And, um, and the fare free where you no longer have to, to think what does it cost or have those barriers of on and off the bus. Those two things have really changed people's commitment and, and um, feeling that Mountain Line is a partner in their community. So, you know, we've got that as a starting place. Now, how do we do the next step? And, and at least from the board's perspective, that's been our, been our assessment of what the community uh, needs in order to, to take the next step with transit. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll go to Ben. I want to note, first of all, the meeting is scheduled, this meeting is scheduled to wrap at 11, and it is 11.01, so I want to be sensitive to anyone who has to leave. Um, feel free to, to uh, filter out if you, if you need to go now. I'm going to um, uh, take a few more questions. Ben. Uh, thanks, Don. That was, that was well put. Uh, um, I wanted to say that the plan here is a kind of infrastructure and, uh, and roadmap for our uh, future investment in, in the routes, but just a reminder that 
Mountain Line offers paratransit and senior van service that has that point-to-point -point component to serve people who need it the most. And so there's uh, that, I hope that doesn't get lost in the shuffle uh, as we discuss these kind of fun, big picture um, infrastructure projects and, and time changes with the, with the planning. Uh, my question for you guys is in the, I haven't had a chance to read the full plan yet. Is there a policy recommendation section? The, the two that I can think of are, uh, a, you know, encouraging in-lane stopping and uh, encouraging development of pedestrian crossings, even if they might not currently meet the warrants in the METCD for, for that. Is, are you making policy recommendations for local leaders to evaluate and, uh, and hopefully pass to make it easier to get these transit projects uh, accomplished? Those words, in-lane stopping and um, pedestrian crossings, absolutely appear in the plan. I do not think we called it out and said, we recommend this policy change. Um, but that's, that's, that's not because we don't recommend it. It's just because it wasn't phrased that way. Um, so I think if, that's, if you need some direct input on that from Mountain Line, um, I think, I think maybe, maybe there are other ways to provide it. I do think you will find a great deal of supportive description in here of what becomes possible once those kinds of changes are made on streets like Brooks and Reserve in particular. Okay. Um, are there any further uh, questions from the committee? Any? I would like Michelle. to build on something um, th uh, that was just said. So uh, thank you for reminding us about paratransit. Um, when, when I say that the long-term network costs two and a half times to operate as much as the existing, I am including the cost of expanding paratransit to as many hours of service as the long-term network would operate. So that means later on weekdays, long Saturdays, and Sundays. So that includes expansion of service that um, is for the most vulnerable people, that does specifically help people who cannot walk two blocks to the route. I mean, a number of the really important destinations that have been mentioned, social service destinations, are close to a route. In fact, many of them are close to a frequent route. But some people cannot make that walk of one or two or three blocks, and for those people, that's why par paratransit exists, and we have carried paratransit forward in this plan at you know a proportionate level of funding as is provided today. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, with regards to long spans, we were in particular thinking about the situation of low-income people and low-wage workers. So the current network works very well if you work an eight-to-five job or you go to school during the week. It does not work well for you if you work in retail or the service industry or restaurants because your hours are definitely including Saturday and Sunday. You cannot work at a restaurant unless you are willing to work the weekend. And if that's the case, then this is not a network that will allow you to forego a car. So for people to choose to rely on your network, including for low-income people to choose to rely on your network, they have to be able to rely on it almost every day and for their most important trip, which is typically their commute. So the expansion into the weekend is important for lots of different kinds of people. It's important for people who want to recreate, for people who want to socialize, but it's also important for low-income people who need to work on the weekends um, or for whom that is their only opportunity to, to reach essential services. So that is a big part of the, the policy uh, reason to invest in seven day a week service. Great. Um, last thing I want to add is that um, transit service is um, uh, expensive to operate, but uh, when when uh, given um, the uh, per trip benefits. Uh, by far the most efficient, cost-effective way to, to move people around. Um, as we move forward in our um, long-range plan with aggressive and aspirational mode split goals, um, it's going to be incredibly important for both the TPCC and, um, and others in the community to um, remember that transit expansion is an incredibly important part of our, um, our mode of achieving our mode split goals. Um, just as we uh, work on other modes and other facilities, um, we need to continue to invest in transit. Um, and so I'm um, appreciative that we have a uh, roadmap for doing that and um, uh, encourage you to continue to keep in touch as we can, um, as we can be of assistance in this. Um, is there any um, additional comment from uh, the public or the, um, or the members of TTAC or anyone? All right. Uh, without anything further, um, we will be adjourned. Thanks for staying around a few minutes.